Well, thank you very much. And again, thanks to the European Pain Federation and Dr. Wells for the invitation to speak here. It's my great pleasure to do so. And I'm here uh, as a member of the Department of Radiology of the Mayo Clinic and also on the board of the Spine Intervention Society, an international multidisciplinary society dedicated to evidence-based spine interventions. We're going to spend the next half hour thereabouts talking about the sacroiliac joint. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose, but I would like to acknowledge uh, those who have contributed to this talk, Dr. Frank Willard, Professor of Anatomy at the University of New England, Dr. Nikolai Bogduck, Emeritus Professor from the University of Newcastle, and Dr. David Kennedy, Associate Professor at uh, Stanford University. Our agenda is a full one for the next half hour. We're going to cover function, anatomy, innervation, imaging, and the appropriate use criteria for interventions of the sacroiliac joint. So the sacroiliac joint, a very sinuous and tortuous joint, and its history in terms of evaluation is equally tortuous. If one looks at the millennium from Hippocrates to Vesalius, it was thought that this joint did not move or was mobile only during pregnancy. In the 17th and 18th century, finally, anatomists discovered a synovial membrane, hence it must move to some degree. It was therefore classified as a joint. And in the 19th century, it was identified that there was movement around a transverse axis at the S2 segment. And the motions of the, the major motions of the sacroiliac joint were defined as nutation, which is sacral rotation anterior relative to the ilium, and counternutation, where the sacrum rotates posterior relative to the ilium. And this rotation occurs about an axial joint, in large quotes, because it does not have synovium uh, at the S2 level, and there's a little protuberance on the iliac side and, and a corresponding depression on the sacral side. So with this notion that it does indeed move, it was, it was deemed a diarthrosis by no less than von Luschka. But later authors said, well, its motion is limited, so we'll call it an amphiarthrosis. Later authors says, let's put it together and call it a diarthro-amphiarthrosis. And the pendulum swung in back and forth. And in the late 1950s, it was again said that, the, that motion was only possible during pregnancy due to the very irregular articular surfaces and ligamentous stabilizers of the joint. But what's really important to us is, does it move, but also does it cause pain? In the early 20th century, when SI joint mobility was thought to be present uh, to a greater degree than in the mid 20th century, it was actively investigated as a cause of low back pain. But then a mixture and bar came along in 1934, and the disc became the focus of all study of the low back. And Gormley, even in 1944, said low back pain cannot result from the SI joint pathology. And later on, in the late 50s, it was said to be an extremely uh, low cause of low back pain. But in the last three decades, or four decades, we have again turned the pendulum again and identified it as a significant cause of low back pain. So let's talk about what does this joint do, a very unique joint. We can think of the pelvis as a stable platform acted upon by three levers, the spine from above and the two legs below. And these, this platform must transmit force, axial force transmitted longitudinally from the spine to the lower extremities, and then transverse forces moving in a two-way direction between the spine and the lower extremities. It is indeed a unique joint. It has a limited but complex range of motion, approximately two degrees in all three planes, and it has no muscles acting across it imparting movement. It is indeed a passive joint. Its primary function is stress relief. Think about a little thought experiment. Think about what happens when, when if you're looking at my, me from the left, what happens when I take a stride? As my left leg swings forward, hamstring tension is going to rotate that ischium forward, and the left hemipelvis is going to rotate clockwise. And as my right leg goes back, the rotation is going to be counterclockwise. So I've now got these opposing torsional movements occurring in a, in a uh, circular structure. So do we have an anatomic model for what happens when you apply those forces to a rigid circular structure? Well, we do. The, the elderly female pelvis may be weakened by osteoporosis and relatively limited motion at those sacroiliac joints. And what happens? You get sacral insufficiency fractures. And where do those fractures occur? Right along the line of the sacroiliac joint. That identifies for us where, where motion or stress relief is necessary. So this stress relief requires a dynamic joint complex. It must be resilient, made resilient by its uh, ligamentous and muscular support. If we talk to our anatomic colleagues, uh, they will describe joint configurations in terms of form closure or force closure. In form closure, the joint integrity is, is maintained by the 
bony configuration entirely, and this will be rigid. Force closure, on the other hand, joint integrity is going to be maintained by tension bands, and this will be dynamic. We can illustrate that uh, in this fashion. It would be perfectly reasonable to make a sacrum as a T-shaped structure and, and articulate with iliac bones, and that would be, that's, that would be extremely rigid, an, an example of form closure, but there's no ability for stress relief. Rather, in a force closure situation, as we have, the uh, sacrum is, is an inverted, is a triangle, and it sits in the congruent cat concavity of the innominate bones, but downward force, axial force, would tend to spread those innominate bones unless they're held in place by a tension band, which is essentially the construct of the uh, sacroiliac joint, and that's a force closure construct. So let's look at the anatomy that builds this force closure construct in the sacroiliac joint. So we're gonna look at it uh, from the front, and here's an anatomic specimen. You can see the sacral promontory here, the internal pelvic brim, the, the iliac crest, the iliacus muscle, the lumbosacral trunk, and the pelvic uh, uh, plexus. So we'll look at that a little bit more. Now we've taken the iliac musculature off, and we can note this small aperture sitting right next to the lumbosacral trunk. That will become more apparent as we dissect open the joint. If we look closely at the joint, the, this will be the plane of the joint line, and we'll then open that joint line and spread it. And there's that little aperture, and it does indeed communicate with the joint. And this is a very common uh, anatomic variant where the communication between the, the, the joint capsule is fenestrated, and there may be communications with adjacent neural elements, hence opportunities for confounding in terms of sacroiliac joint injections. If we now spread the joint, this is not at all the pearly white cartilage you're used to seeing in a relatively healthy joint. This is an elderly sacroiliac joint, but there's really no, no pearly white uh, at all to be seen. This is a C-shaped or ear-shaped joint, and that axial joint about which rotation occurs is out here, and it is indeed extra-articular. And there's the shape of the C-joint, and this is, corresponds to the arthrogram we demonstrate when we inject the joint and fill it with contrast media. What does the internal bony anatomy look like? Well, remember that only S1 and S2 and maybe a small portion of S3 contribute to the sacroiliac joint. There's incredible individual variability, and the inter interdigitating grooves and ridges in the joint give it a very high coefficient of friction. In fact, it's the highest coefficient of friction of any uh, synovial joint. And it's wedge-shaped in two planes to resist inferior translation and posterior translation. If we look at it in the coronal plane, again, it's a wedge-shaped uh, with a congruent receptacle of the iliac bones, and this, and this resists inferior translation. And in the axial plane, the wedge resists posterior translation of the sacrum relative to the iliac bones. But that joint line is, changes as we go from cephalad to caudal. Up at the S1 level, it's very, usually very oblique, uh, uh, posteromedial to anterolateral. But as you go caudally, it starts to swing and now becomes almost vertical. And you can see it in transition at the S2 level. And you come down to S3, and now it's indeed uh, uh, posterolateral to anteromedial. So it undergoes a very complex curvature as you go from cephalad to caudal. And uh, these CT illustrations also show is what all radiologists know, that the holy bone, the sacrum, is the source of all very, very creepy images that derive from radiology. They're all very anthropomorphic. So let's look again at the internal structure of the joint. The sacral surface is covered by hyaline cartilage, relatively thick, where the iliac surface is covered only by very thin fibrocartilage. And it's a very small capacity joint as it moves little. Uh, Fortin, in his study of patients with sacroiliac joint pain, the range of volumes was one to two and a half cc's, and Fortin and Dreyfus agree about 1.5 cc's for normal volunteers. When you look at studies about sacroiliac joint injections, look at the volume injected. Many of the early studies, you saw six cc's, eight cc's. I don't know where that was, but it wasn't in the sacroiliac joint or it wasn't entirely in the sacroiliac joint. So the, sacro, the sacroiliac joint also undergoes normal change uh, with, with uh, aging, and I prefer to call these aging changes, not degenerative changes. Degenerative implies some pathologic process, and this is just normal aging. In the embryonic state, it is indeed there, a smooth uh, articular surface that glides, and that persists throughout the first decade. 
But as you get to the second decade, that surface roughens. We'll see development of osteophytes and cartilage degeneration in the fourth or fifth decade, and debris in that joint, which I sometimes feel in my sixth and seventh decade, and ultimately relatively little mobility by the eighth decade. Now it's very important as we think about this as a force closure construct to think not just about the, the articular joint, but also the surrounding muscles and, and ligaments. They are absolutely key to the process and also participate in potential pain generation. If one looks at dorsal ligamentous support, the, mo the, most, uh, the strongest uh, ligaments are the interosseous ligaments. Remember only the anterior aspect of the most cephalad portion of the joint is indeed synovial. Posterior to that, it'll all be interosseous ligaments. And this encloses that axial joint at the S2 level about which rotation occurs. And then more superficial to the interosseous ligament, we'll see the short and then long dorsal sacroiliac ligaments, the multifidus mus uh, musculature, and then the composite thoracolumbar fascia. And we'll show you some illustrations of that. Here we see looking down on the sacral uh, canal here and the sacral crest, only the anterior aspect of the upper SI joint is synovial. Then we have these very dense interosseous ligaments, and then more superficially, the short dorsal sacroiliac ligaments. This will all be multifidus muscle enclosed in the composite uh, thoracolumbar fascia. The other major ligaments holding our pelvis in place, that the pubic symphysis, and the more, the more central sacrospinous ligament, and the more peripheral sacrotuberous ligament. And we can identify those here looking at a specimen. We're now looking at the posterior aspect of a specimen. And here's the iliac crest. Here's the posterior superior iliac spine. Here's the thoracolumbar fascia. It's been removed on the subject's left side. And we can now see the multifidus muscle and those long dorsal sacroiliac ligaments, piriform muscle coming through here, uh, and then the uh, sacrospinous ligament and sacrotuberous ligament. If we take off that thoracolumbar fascia, we have multifidus muscle here, and now we've removed the multifidus muscle, and now we can see those short dorsal sacroiliac ligaments. On the ventral side, we have the anterior sacroiliac ligaments, but most importantly, the anterior abdominal wall musculature. That's a critical portion of this tension band that holds the sacroiliac joint in place, and critically tells us and informs us of the necessity of rehabilitation involving that anterior abdominal wall. So this tension band is going to tend, and we'll look at that in a, in a few moments here, and it's going to, that tension band, the anterior wall, is going to tend to pull the iliac uh, crest anteriorly. And we'll show you that in a diagram here. So let's look at a specimen again. We'll take a section through this thoracolumbar fascia and its attached gluteal musculature. And here's a CT giving us that cross-sectional image. And if we now look at this diagrammatically, so the anterior abdominal wall is going to try and bring those iliac crests together. Uh, that's going to pivot on the anterior aspect of the sacroiliac joint. So to countermand that, we must really fix this posteriorly, and we fix it posteriorly by a, a clamp, which is that, uh, that composite thoracal, uh, abdominal fa thoracal lumbar fascia. And deep to that, we have the, mus uh, the multifidus musculature. So here is indeed our tension band, which surrounds and holds this SI joint in place. Anteriorly, it's all the anterior abdominal wall musculature, posteriorly multifidus musculature, and that tight thoracolumbar fascia. All of those participate in holding that SI joint in place and are critical when one considers rehabilitation of this joint. Now, if this joint is going to hurt, it has to be innervated. So what does the uh, literature tell us about this? Well, if we go back way to the 19th century German literature, it would suggest there was a significant ventral component, later confirmed by Akadean in 1991, where there was innervation seen from the L5 ventral ramus, the S2 ventral ramus, and the sacral plexus. But it's long been known that the dominant innervation is dorsal. Bradley, Grob, Willard, and McGrath all defined varying degrees of, of a dorsal innervation to the sacroiliac joint. And the most recent study is that of Roberts, who uh, very carefully categorized and showed that S1 and S2 lateral branches contributed to the dorsal innervation of the SI joint in 100% of specimens, the S3 lateral branch in nearly 90%, with lesser contributions from the L5 uh, dorsal ramus and the L4 lateral branch. Let's look at those in a specimen. And again, my thanks to Dr. Willard. These are his dissections from the University of New England. Uh, here we've got the, um, the multifidus musculature. There's the iliac crest. And now we're going to take that uh, musculature down. And here we can see small little neural twiglets interposed within the, uh, the short uh, dorsal sacroiliac ligaments. If we look, come on down to the periosteum level and dissect all this network of neural elements free, 
We can see communications between the L5 dorsal ramus uh, and the S1 lateral branches and the S2 lateral branches. This is indeed a network, and it's not a consistent network. Here's a lateral view of an, on a dissection, and here's the L5 communicating branch, com which uh, will communicate with the S1 lateral branches. Another specimen showing this reet of, uh, of neural elements moving uh, laterally from those lateral branches towards the sacroiliac joint and its accompanying li uh, ligaments. In a most diagrammatic fashion, this is what it looks like, but this is far too regular. It's not this regular at all. It's not predictable. And this is what more looks like. It's an unpredictable intercommunication plexus of, of neural elements passing laterally to, in to innervate the ligaments and the sacroiliac joint itself. So how about imaging? I'm a radiologist. What, is Im what does imaging tell us or not tell us about that sacroiliac joint? Well, as we said, it's a very sinuous, curvy joint. It changes its major plane uh, of, uh, of, uh, and of axial, its major axial plane as you go from cephalad to caudal. And this results in a confusing look, perhaps, on the frontal image. It looks like we have, indeed, two joints. Well, the major axis is going to be posteromedial to anterolateral, and that will tell us that the most uh, medial aspect or expression of the joint will typically be its posterior portion, and the more lateral aspect will be its anterior portion. If we do an arthrogram of this sacroiliac joint, we see a very, very thin synovial space. Only about 20% of the width of that cortex to cortex is indeed synovium, a synovial space. It's a very, very thin uh, structure. And this will, again, accept only maybe one or at most two cc's of contrast or therapeutic agent. And remember, fix this in your mind. If you're not getting images like that, it's not in the joint. And here it is filling all the way up to the top, remembering that that, that most cephalad extent, it's only synovial anteriorly. Now, plain films, plain radiographs, or CT, where we're simply looking at structural changes of the sacroiliac joint, unfortunately do not correlate with pain. Typical changes of aging, sometimes overlapping with osteoarthritis, meaning marginal osteophytes, sclerosis, joint space narrowing, uh, vacuum phenomena have no correlation with pain. A study using CT, very poor uh, sensitivity and specificity. Now when we look at bone scans, now a physiologic parameter, so, so uh, nuclear medicine studies are going to be a manifestation of hyperemia and increased bone turnover, so this is a physiologic parameter, and it turns out this is quite specific, but a very low sensitivity. So a positive bone scan is helpful, but a negative bone scan is not helpful. MRI, we also have uh, MRI uh, imaging characteristics, which are physiologic in nature. T2 hyperintensity or T1 hypointensity are manifestations of edema. Gadolinium enhancement is a manifestation of hyperemia and leaky capillaries. And in patients with, with uh, inflammatory spondyloarthropathies, this does indeed very much correlate with disease activity. So it's a, good, it's a good correlate of disease activity in true inflammatory spondyloarthropathies, but it's not very good predictor of pain in the non-inflammatory spondyloarthropathy patient who simply has osteoarthritis or sacroiliac joint dysfunction. This pa there's another patient showing T2 hyperintensity in a patient with axial spondyloarthritis, uh, formerly called ankylosing spondylitis. And we can also see fatty deposition on a T1-weighted image as a manifestation of chronic in, uh, inflammation on a CT, sclerosis, subchondral erosions, a widening of the joint space. Uh, and here this patient has the characteristic findings of axial spondyloarthritis with squaring and, and sclerosis of those lumbar vertebral bodies. So we're going to spend the last bit of time now talking about intervening in this very complex and unique joint. And this is coming under the guise of the, of the appropriate use criteria for fluoroscopically guided diagnostic and therapeutic sacroiliac joint invention, uh, interventions. And this was a, an effort of the Spine Intervention Society, but who led and hosted a large number of sister societies in this effort. So this included the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery, the American Society of Anesthesiologists, the American College of Radiology, American Academy of, Phys of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, American Academy of Pain Medicine, and North American Spine Society. So we had great buy-in by our sister societies, and this was our initial effort to create this AUC, or Appropriate Use Criteria. And we wanted to provide physicians with a tool for understanding when it was appropriate to use diagnostic and therapeutic interventions, but also provide payers with guidance as when this is a, when the appropriate utilization was occurring. And this used the RAND UCLA appropriate methodology.
First, an evidence panel uh, was, was generated, and these developed systematic reviews of the existing evidence. This took over two years. And they developed clinical scenarios and, the de and provided definitions and assumptions. And then a totally separate ratings panel was convened from all our sister societies who reviewed those definitions, assumptions, and evidence and applied them to a rating of appropriateness of these many, many clinical scenarios. So let's first look at what those systematic reviews showed. So let's look at the evidence regarding the sacroiliac joint. Sure, what is disease prevalence? How often is this a cause of axial back pain? In a range of studies, it seems to hover around 20 to 25 percent, most commonly. If one looks at the work of uh, Michael De Palma, who very systematically looked at patients who had axial back pain and systematically applied uh, anesthetic tests to identify the true cause of back pain, none of this non-specific back pain business, this is proven back pain where we know what the cause is, he was able to show that over, that over lifespan, sacroiliac joint uh, as a cause of pain rises in prevalence to about age 70 and then falls off. Very similar to that seen with facet joint interventions become more common up to about age 70 and then fall off in prevalence. Internal disc derangement as a cause of pain, uh, axial pain is very common in the young but falls off precipitously as we age. And other causes, often sinister causes, become more prevalent as you get past age 70. So this, this prevalence data exists and it's well thought out. Another unique circumstance is the post-lumbar fusion spine. And this is not surprising. Now we have taken a, a, when we fuse portions of the lumbar spine adjacent to the sacroiliac joint, we've essentially made that an adjacent segment. And multiple studies have suggested that in a patient with axial pain post-fusion, there's a much higher likelihood that the sacroiliac joint is indeed the cause of that pain, hovering somewhere between 30 and 40 percent. Now, can we make the diagnosis with physical exam? We would like to be able to do that. What do we know about sacroiliac joint pain? It's often associated with pain rising from sitting. It's usually localized below the L5 spinous process, and it's usually unilateral. Those three features give you an odds ratio of 3.4 in making the diagnosis of sacroiliac joint pain. There are numerous physical exam uh, tests which have sought to identify the patient with sacroiliac joint pain, but no single test is predicted. If, on the other hand, you, use, you have three or more positive tests, then association with a positive intraarticular uh, injection has an odds ratio of 27, really quite remarkably high. So unilateral pain below L5, three positive uh, physical examination tests, that correlates to a 74% probability that is indeed sacroiliac joint pain. And this is not simply one study, another study by Van Werf, here measured against dual sacroiliac joint intraarticular injections, so a much higher level of, of, of evidence, again showed that three or more positive tests have correlated very strongly with a positive intraarticular block. So how about treating uh, intraarticular sacroiliac joint pain? Now, intraarticular pain, we'll talk about sacroiliac joint complex pain in a few moments. So intraarticular pain, this systematic review uh, looked at 39 studies of diagnostic SIJ injections, 15 studies of therapeutic SIJ injections, and seven pre-existing systematic reviews. The caveats to this, you have to look inside the evidence, look inside those studies, and make sure they make sense and that you're using appropriate techniques. The injections must be target-specific. They must be in the joint. That means real-time fluoroscopy. It cannot be done by palpation. It cannot be done by ultrasound. And if, the, if there's not validation that those injections were indeed intraarticular, then it's really not a useful study. And you have to also note that there's limited volume. If it's five or six cc's, it's not valid. The challenge we have with sacroiliac joint diagnostic blocks is we have no pathoanatomic reference standard. We can't take that sacroiliac joint out and look at it and say, oh, that was painful. It's not possible. We, we expect, based on the studies I've shown you a few moments ago, a prevalence of somewhere between 20 or 30 percent in, in a clinically suspected population. We really don't have any idea what the prevalence is in a general population. We also know, very much like has been discussed with the facet joint, that single blocks have a high false positive rate, hovering around 20 percent. So to truly make a diagnosis, you need a dual block paradigm. And this is not an easy thing to do to do in sacroiliac joint injections. It looks like it's a, it's a piece of cake. You know, there's a, there's a joint that looks like it's five millimeters wide. How can I not get a needle into that? Well, actually, intercepting that synovial space is not simple. 
Uh, the, the failure rate in the literature is between 4 and 20 percent, and I would suspect in real practice it's substantially higher than that. If you don't see that very thin arthrogram, it's not in the joint. Unfortunately, as we looked at this, the, using the grade analysis, we could not, it was not possible to grade this evidence in terms of diagnostic sacroiliac joint injections. The literature simply is not strong enough. If one looks at sacroiliac joint therapeutic injections, there are two RCTs, all in spondyl arthropathy patients. There are not ideal trials, one explanatory, one uh, pragmatic. And there were a number of uh, observational studies, not sufficiently strong to upgrade it, so it remains a moderate quality of evidence for therapeutic sacroiliac joint injections. Now we also we have to make the distinction from interarticular pain to sacroiliac joint complex pain. Those ligamentous structures surrounding the joint are also innervated and they, be, they may be the cause of pain and we need to make the distinction. And it is the, and the typically the source of the pain will be the, the inner osseous ligaments or the dorsal sacroiliac joint ligaments. And lateral branch blocks were developed to intercept the nociception going to that those ligamented structures. Single depth lateral branch blocks as described by Paul Dreyfus back in 2008 failed to consistently intercept those fibers. If you put a needle down to the periosteum and deliver a local anesthetic there, you're not going to intercept those fibers that are interwoven in all those ligamentous tissues. So you really need to do multi-depth, multi-site blocks, and that's what uh, Paul ultimately published uh, a couple years later. And here, in a very elegant study, he showed in cadaveric studies that multi-site, multi-depth blocks, that is blocking a, in an arc around the lateral aspect of those sacral foramina at multiple depths, that you will indeed, indeed intercept that nociception about, with about a 91% accuracy. And they also showed with normal volunteers that you could render those joints non-nociceptive with this appropriate block. What was fascinating in this study was that only 20% of those subjects who had been rendered insensate to probing of the ligaments were then insensate to distension of the joint. And that tells us with certainty there has to be some significant ventral innervation as well. The way to, com to conceptualize this or somewhat complex problem is to think that intraarticular blocks identify joint pain, lateral uh, multi-site, multi-depth branch blocks identify ligamentous pain. The systematic review that looked at the diagnosis and treatment of posterior sacroiliac joint complex pain, uh, the grade of evidence for the diagnosis was moderate quality, as was that for radiofrequency neurotomy for lateral branches. There are two explanatory trials, 13 supportive observational trials. Uh, the most recent uh, explanatory trial, that of Nilish Patel in uh, 2012, he selected patients with greater than 75% relief from dual sacral lateral branch blocks, randomized two to one to treatment to control, and we can see significant pain relief out to nine months, and also significant pain relief in those patients who crossed over from the sham group. The sham group had only 12% uh, pain relief, reaching a threshold of 50% improvement. And here are all the observational trials, quite heterogeneous, both in patient selection and in, uh, in technique of, of uh, radiofrequency denervation. Now the ratings panel took these two systematic reviews and independently assessed more than 10,000 potential clinical scenarios, twice. And they rated appropriate utilization from one to nine, one being clearly inappropriate, nine being absolutely appropriate with, these, with this three-tiered category. These are all tabulated and then they form the basis, the database from which the, uh, the appropriate use criteria was built. When evidence was lacking, obviously we have to fall back on expert opinion. Uh, sadly the case in, due to the relative weakness of some of this literature. This AUC portal is now available on the Spine Intervention Society website, and it allows you as a practitioner to select the, the, paradigm, the, uh, the features that you see in your patient in terms of what's the physical exam, what's the imaging, what's the history, and get an assessment based on the literature whether intervention is appropriate or not. Five modules were clinical indications and imaging, clearly the most important one, use of anticoagulants, timing of injections, number of injections, and lateral branch RF neurotomy. Here's a screenshot from the SIS uh, website showing the appropriate use criteria, those five modules. And if we say we're going to look at a pa patient who has pain over the SI joint and in the groin, we'll then be presented with a number of choices to make. And if this patient uh, has 
degenerative changes in both the lumbar spine and SIJ on imaging. Their test history, they have one to two uh, positive provocation tests. They have their uh, provocation tests for the hip are negative. They're, they've not had any diagnostic spinal injections. They have had a negative hip injection and their history is one of no apparent inciting event. That will tell us that it's appropriate to consider doing an intraarticular corticosteroid or diagnostic uh, local anesthetic injection. If one changes simply one parameter, we take away that test history and say the provocation tests are now negative, now the, the recommendation is negative. And you can see there are, there are indeed 10,000 uh, potential combinations of these clinical scenarios which, you can, which we can apply. This was a multi-year effort by Spine Intervention Society. It was challenged by a less than robust evidence base, uh, but innumerable lessons were learned in this process. And now we're going to move forward and provide an appropriate use criteria on lumbar transforaminal epidural steroid injections based on those lessons learned. We'll again lead a group of sister societies uh, to go undergo this fairly mammoth task. I will update the SIS systematic reviews on epidural steroid injections, which, were, which was published in 2013, but numerous, a significant amount of literature has occurred since that time. We'll identify clinical scenario variables, assumptions, and definitions, and a ratings panel will be recruited next year. So I'd like to thank you for your attention and invite you to uh, come to our SIS Society uh, meeting in San Francisco in 2017 and our Lisbon conference in October just next month. And yes, indeed, the joint does move, just not very much. So thank you very much.